What's going on, Blenders? It's Sean, back to introduce you to another bonus episode of Real Blend, this time with director Tom George, who has a movie coming to theaters called See How They Run. Uh, we wanted to come on the show because you're going to see that between now and the end of the year, uh, we're going to see an influx of whodunits, and, and they're approaching it from different sides. Tom George's film, uh, which has Sam Rockwell and Saoirse Ronan, is more of a period piece, uh, and it's structured around a, a murder taking place at the Agatha Christie staging of uh, see, um, of the show The Mousetrap, which is a little bit what See How They Run is based on. So it's a little bit of like a murder mystery inside of a murder mystery and a clever way to approach it. Later on, uh, we'll talk about Ryan Johnson's uh, Glass Onion, a Knives Out movie, when that film comes closer in December, which is a totally different way into uh, the, the whodunit structure. Uh, and I think both of them are really interesting for different reasons. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we got Tom George on. We're bringing it to you as a bonus episode. We can also confirm uh, 100% that we will be back with a full episode this Friday. We're going to be recording it shortly after I record uh, this intro for Tom George, uh, but we couldn't wait any longer to get this one out here because see how they run is um, in theaters for people to go see. Make sure you, that you check it out. So without further ado, this is the Real Blend interview with Tom George on behalf of the new murder mystery comedy, See How They Run. We are a filmmaker driven podcast, and so we like to get into the nitty gritty about um, your process, essentially, uh, and how films come together. And our, our audience has expectations of hearing some really nerdy stories so feel free to geek out uh, as much as possible i'm excited great good, Boy, good. Uh, it's great to be here thanks for having me no oh, thank you uh, so the actual uh theater show the mousetrap is actually integral uh to your storyline and so i just wanted you to talk a bit about what your relationship is with the show had you been able to get a chance to go over it and see it and and how it might have affected you had you sat through it guys never seen it Never seen the play. Um, it, the truth is, we were due. I was due to go and watch it, um, and then there was a global pandemic. I don't know if you heard about that where you are, um, but um, <laughs> yeah, that made it uh, not possible. Um, and at the time, I was quite, you know, disappointed. Actually, I think it came to stand me in quite good stead because it was clear that um, you. It, it was important, I think. Um, to distance ourselves enough from the mouse trap, in as much as like you don't need to have seen the mouse trap to to enjoy see how they run, you know anything that is um, taken from that play um, and referenced at all should be the sort of um, the goodies on the top of the cake rather mm -hmm. than anything else, you know, uh, more integral than that. And in fact. It draws, Mark's script was so clever because it drew not just from the mousetrap, but all sorts of different areas of the Christie kind of um, back catalogue, I suppose, in all sorts of different ways. But well, we agreed from the start that that should be the text, the, the sort of extra texture on top of um, what had to be a great story and some great characters that worked in their own right, irrespective of that sort of meta layer. So just as a quick follow up, I, in doing research for it, I realized that there in 1959, they were trying to mount a film adaptation uh, of the yeah. movie with Tyrone Power. And I was curious if you knew about that at all and if it affected your approach. The truth, the, the sort of true fact where the whole project started was that um, the kernel of truth at the center of our film and, and, and in real life is that um, The Mousetrap was a big hit on the West End, you know, the biggest show of its time. And people wanted to make a film adaptation of it. And Christie signed a contract to say you can adapt the mousetrap with a caveat that you could only begin production once the original theatrical run had come to an end. Oh, okay. And of course, the, the you know, the joke as we now know <laughs> is never it's never come to an end. She thought, <laughs> she, she thought that it would last eight months, maybe 10. You know, that okay. was the sort of that and that at the time was huge, like. I think that already would have outstripped the record um, run, or maybe the record run at the time was a year or somewhere around that mark. Okay, but it it blew it out of the water, like how long mm -hmm. it went on to run, and and so on the one hand, it was like impossible to make a film of the the mouse trap, but it also felt like I think when um, Damien, the producer, first hit upon that uh, little nugget, like that could be the start of uh, something, and this idea of a, a murder taking place 
at the world's most famous murder mystery. <clears throat> Tom, I want to talk about when directing uh, a murder mystery, how you make sure you don't sort of tip your hand with your own directorial style, like put any uh, subconscious hints about the resolution that might give it away. Did you ever have to kind of scale yourself back or pull yourself back as a director to make sure that you weren't doing anything that was accidentally giving it away? Yeah, well, there were a lot of things already, you know, built into the script um, that, you know, tease certain elements that might come to pass, you know, further down the line in the film. Uh, it's definitely, you know, a key part of it is, we knew from the start we wanted it to function as a satisfying thriller, a th mm -hmm. satisfying murder mystery in its own right, but also as a comedy, you know, and mm -hmm. tuning those two things um, was a big part of the process. You know, too much comedy um, and it, it starts to undermine the stakes of your, of your, your thriller. Um, but at the same time, you know, you play the dramatic elements too hard and the comedy drifts away. Um, but certainly alongside that, you know, it was a learning curve for me in terms of um, just how you want to deliver that information and the right amount of information. You know, the, you, you don't want the audience to get ahead of the mystery and crack the thing too early. Mm -hmm. We've all, you know, seen films where that happens and you totally check out, right? So, um, but at the same time, by the time they get to that finale, you don't want to feel like it's come out of nowhere. So um, that was a process throughout writing, shooting, certainly, but but particularly in the edit, as you can imagine. I, a quick follow up. How much do you think about what it's going to be like the second time someone watches this movie? Do you think about like, you know, once we know all the secrets and we go back to the top, do you put things in for the people watching it the second time around? For me, I always hope that in my work, there's uh, uh, enough layers and enough detail, you know, that um, that it will like it make for a satisfying watch on a second time around. Mm -hmm. um, and that applies to everything. Certainly like Mark's script from, you know, the first time I read it, it was clear that it was so detailed um, that there would be stuff that um, you might get, you might not, you know, um, and that on subsequent viewings, it, you know, there might be more and more for you to find as you go along, but also comically, you know, I, I like to work in a way that, um, that you, there's a lot of, you'll have seen, there's a lot of two shots in the film. There's a lot of ensemble framing, you know. I'm not really one um, for, you know, cutting for a single for the line and cutting for the reaction, cutting for the, mm -hmm. you know, next line, cutting for the reaction, you know. Because for me, it's always been a more rewarding watch as an audience member when you aren't led by the nose quite to that extent through comedy. Um, we've got these two brilliant characters played by Sam and Saoirse side by side. And it just instinctively felt right to present them, you know, in a two shot on a, a you know, almost throughout the movie. Um, and what that means is you've got the funny line and you've got the reaction. And then maybe there's something else that you hadn't noticed first time around, a funny thing that Sam's doing in the background while some, some while the key bit of action that you're focusing on on the first watch is going on. Yeah, that's a long way of saying um, I hope it stands up to a second viewing. And that's always <laughs> like, I always find that like when a filmmaker's put in that much care and attention to detail into the thing, the audience can pick up on it by almost by osmosis, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you can't identify the specific things on a first or even a second watch, you know, it, it, it comes through. You, you pick up that this is like a fully layered textured world with loads of, um, loads of interesting things percolating in it. Yeah. So, and those two shots are really effective in the car as well. Like when you have like a bit going back and forth between Saoirse and Sam, like even like, like there's that moment in the trailer about like, you know, jumping to conclusions like that works really funny. It's a funny moment because there it's in the same shot. There's no safety of the cut. There's no like it, it's like even the awkwardness or the tension of that is great. Um, and I want to ask you about the one eight five aspect ratio, because I think that's a really interesting choice um, as a filmmaker, because you obviously could go widescreen, standard widescreen, 239, 235. Um, but 185 gives you a really tall ratio. It gives you a lot of space up and down. And I just wonder like how that space factors into the mystery of it. Um, how much you want us focusing on the full frame, looking up and down and how tall things are and um, the narrative decision to shoot in 185. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I think it was driven less by the mystery element um, and more by the core, the heart of the story, which is you've got these two uh, police detectives entering this world where they are completely out of their depth in different ways, but they do not fit in. 
Um, and so it's clear that we'd, you know, from a sort of costume point of view, that we'd have these two quite monochromatic um, police detective figures, Saoirse in her police uniform, Sam in his detective, you know, sort of this classic kind of uh, detective outfit. Um, and it just felt like um, a natural bit of storytelling to be able to present these two monochromatic characters entering this rich and vibrant world of West End theatre land. And the great thing about the taller frame of 185 is you really get to place the characters within their environment, yeah. particularly in, in a largely interior environment. You know, we, we, we don't have many sweeping landscapes in this movie. It's very, it's sort of Soho, central London, um, built up urban environment and lots of interiors, obviously. Um, and so it's a great way to be able to like see those characters in that uh, environment and make those uh different locations really speak to the characters who are who, who they belong to as well I think I particularly think that in like Mervyn's apartment for example when we go to his apartment and his whole um his whole flat speaks to his character you know this this mm. this um this guy who's brought back curiosities from all over the world he's a bit of a hoarder he's got you know he, he wears his intellect uh very much like in the things that he puts around him mm. so um yeah so it was really rooted by that that central thing of these two fish out of water characters I think. when do you make that decision um because like like obviously you go into production you have rehearsals you know i mean it, when is the decision made with your dp when you go all right we're gonna do 185 because that that isn't it, it's a it's a big choice. I mean, like, because I mean, you could always shoot at one eight five and then still crop it to two three nine if you really wanted to, if you were able to like shoot it correctly. You know, if you wanted to play with that. But I mean, I mean, it's got to be an interesting decision to make. Yeah, definitely. It was in um, it was in the uh, pre production that Jamie and I made that decision, and it, it certainly wasn't like nailed on from the start. We did some shot some tests, um, but also more than that, as I was continuing to storyboard certain sequences. And Jamie was increasingly involved in that process. Um, and he understood how I wanted to use the visual layer of the storytelling to reinforce, um, you know, the script. It, it, it kind of um, more and more became the obvious choice, I suppose. So that by the end, it was like, we'd, we, you know, I think we'd started off debating more actively, like, you know, uh, would we do, you know, 235, 185, which, what route would, would we go? And, and then I think we both came to the, you know, the point where we, we just turned to each other at a certain point and said, it's going to be one eight five, right? That's what we're doing. You know, it just, awesome. it kind of got, there. I love, I love that ratio. It's actually works. It actually works great at home too. Cause it, you know, you get more of the screen, you get more of the image on your screen at home. Yeah. They, they can't, they can't move the screens at home. Like you do in a theater. So. Yeah. Well, I knew that I wanted to like frame people in groups as much as possible. And the, the yeah. two shot and the mid shot would be King. There's barely any close ups of um, characters. Uh, objects get sort of close ups more than people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, um, but it was interesting going back to what you were saying about the two shots in the car. The other side to it is that, um, it opens up the possibility for improv, um, or little alternate, um, takes on lines or for you just to continue to work the material on the floor, which is always part of the way I like to work. And, you know, part of the challenge was how do we, um, how do we have that freedom to be able to work in that way? And if you're in a high coverage situation where you've got three sizes of a single on someone and then you're turning around and come around for the other person's three sizes, mm. when you get halfway through that and you want to change a line, it's like, well, what are we going to do? Go back and shoot, you know, uh, turn back around and shoot that. That, yeah. that. The nice thing about, you know, putting people in a two shot is, um, and particularly letting that exchange run for half a scene means that you can continue to work the material. You know you're going to have the other side of that, their reaction to that line or their response to that line because you've got both of them on camera. Mm. Uh, so it was def that was definitely a part of it, you know, for me is trying to have at least that possibility of, um, of improv or things um, rising to the surface, like available to us. And actually outside the Savoy in the car is one of my favorite moments that did arise in that way um, when when Sam asks Saoirse, uh, do you write everything down in your notebook? <laughs> um, and she says, uh, uh, well, only if it's important, sir. And he says, well, how do you know if it's important? <laughs> that was actually a cold out and scripted. That was like a hard out, like just he left her with that kind of cliffhanger ending to a scene and we, we cut away somewhere else. And through like rehearsal, I think Sam and Saoirse and I had talked about 
well maybe you know i'm always interested in if you like play things long at the end of the scene whether it leads you anywhere and nine times out of ten it doesn't but once in a while it throws up something interesting so we said look what if you just follow that thread like what does she say yeah and so Sersha came up with this thing where she's like well you know i sort of we I write everything down and then when we find out later what's important we'll know that it's already in the notebook so, <laughs> <laughs> you know? so it's really like satisfying that there are moments like that that um we managed to like find along the way with the cars well, and, and Tom, I, I feel like whenever people give Sersha a chance to be funny, um, it, it reminds us of like, you know, whether it's Lady Bird or Grand Budapest or something like that. And you're like, oh, that's right. She's extremely funny. And and she's she's terrific in this movie. Uh, and, you know, is almost she's being set up by Sam, you know, in so many of the scenes. And so I want you to be able to talk about letting her be funny, because also the, the thing that the movie does that I really love the most is that it it openly pokes fun at the whodunit tropes, um, but then almost admits that, like, it, we also can't tell an, an interesting story without using some of them. And a lot of them <laughs> fall back on her kind of thing. So can you just talk about the approach uh, of embracing them and, and letting her sort of go go to town on them? Yeah, well, um, the first thing I'll say is that it was not scripted to be an Irish character. Like it was scripted as a London accent. And when, you know, Sersha was the first person that I thought of for that part, we sent her the script. And on the first chat that we had um, remotely over Zoom, she, one of the first things she, we discussed was she said, well, how do you feel about me doing it in my own accent? And I'm always, you know, one for um, kind of giving as little acting for the actor to do as possible, right? Don't give them extra things to worry about if they if you don't need to do that you know don't give the, the classics like fake tv watching right mm. like if you've ever you know you, you you if you have people watching tv and they're not watching something on a screen <laughs> you never sell it right because there's <laughs> that granular specific thing about what the eyes do or what your body language does and where your attention where your gaze is drawn that you pick up on like without realizing it is that like typing on a on a laptop also no yeah, one taps I mean, on a there's laptop a, there's, convincingly. there's definitely times where the sound um sound team step in and say look you can't see that laptop can you please not have a uh tapping all the way through <laughs> but um but yeah it, it's sort of you know so it was really exciting to me to think of her doing it in her accent again particularly in terms of things like looseness uh improvisation and um and it fitted so well with the character to have this um you know, young Irish women who come to London in the 1950s. It was, it, it felt like it enriched the character almost kind of instantly. Um, so, um, you know, so so that was great. And we so rarely get to see Saoirse doing her own accent. Like you, I had no like worries that she was going to be really funny in this film, because, you know, but I think for her, it was still a step into the unknown in terms of it being a kind of out and out comedy in, in some ways. I think that's how she would think of it. You know, mm. um, Lady Bird is like more in the comedy drama sort of world, I suppose. Sure. But, you know, I always felt like um, I loved her in that film. And as soon as we talked about it, it, it was key that she just got the tone, you know, and that for the director, when you're bringing a cast together is probably the single biggest, you know, thing is like, do, do the cast get what it is that you're trying to, you know, achieve with this, where you're trying to pitch things tonally. And this was a complex piece tonally because on the one hand, you've got, you know, this murder mystery, it's got to work as a murder mystery, as I've said. Um, but, um, but it's, it, it's a period piece, but it's got a very modern kind of thread running through it. Um, and I kind of always felt like performances would be the key to that. If it had this kind of rooted, understated, um, contemporary comic feel to the performances that would like create a really um, fun tension between this, what you, your expectations of the stuffy uh, drawing room murder mystery um, uh, with everyone being a little bit arch and a little bit over the top, you know? There's a terrific so, um, element when the one that. actress the one actress walks in and she goes, uh, 
you got me. I did it. And Sersha immediately turns around and starts reading her, her rights. And Sam Rockwell's kind of like, relax, relax. She's to turn yeah. a phrase. And as you said, like the other side of it, obviously, is, is Sam. It's like really, uh, I think of the film as like a story of a partnership, right? Really, that's what's going on beneath it. It's like there's a murder mystery, but really it's the story of this like dysfunctional partnership and whether they're going to be able to get on the same page, come together to crack the case. Right. And you know, watching Sam and Sersha come together to like, um, you know, play those roles was just the total joy every day. And Sam, as you rightly say, is often the straight man, you know, it, particularly in the first, you know, kind of act of the film, he's the straight man and Sersha gets a lot of the, you know, the, the kind of funny, funny lines. And I think in other hands, that Stoppard character could, um, become a little neutral or mute or not very interesting. And the brilliant thing about Sam is that he makes choices that other people wouldn't. And he just opens up the character with like nuance and detail and, and kind of um, makes you want to know what's going on under the surface, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually perfectly leads into my next question, because I do want to talk about Sam, because I feel like even though obviously he has an Oscar, but I still feel like Sam Rockwell is just a genuinely underappreciated actor. And I'm curious about what is it about him that works so well for so many different. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. What was that? Yeah, he's a real up and comer. Yeah, he's I, I, yeah, I know, right? Like one of these days, it's gonna he's just really gonna take off. But I, I just like I, I, I feel like they're they're I, I, he's the kind of actor that like I have to grab like common moviegoers and be like, you love this guy, whether or not you truly realize it. So I was just wondering, like, what are some of his performances? Maybe you wish more average moviegoers appreciated more because, like, personally, I think he should have gotten an Oscar nomination or even one for Moon. I like I thought Moon was phenomenal. Not enough, not enough people talk about that. Or Moon. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. Yeah, yeah. Moon is like particularly astonishing. The a, ping pong scene. I mean, what a what a I mean, moment. He like single handedly, literally carries the whole mm -hmm. film. And, and <laughs> I think that's you know, that if you haven't seen Moon for some reason, definitely you know go and see that. Um, and you know, on the comedy side, you know, he's obviously worked a lot on Martin McDonough's films. And oh yeah, and those you know, Seven Psychopaths, and then more recently Three Billboards. Um, Matchstick Men with Ridley is oh true. yes, oh, that's a man. great film. Yeah, yeah. For me, it felt like exciting to put him in the center of um, a comic world. You know, I, I I think from certainly recent memory, he he's often in the ensemble playing a like really funny part who steals scenes. Mm -hmm. Right, um, sure. Jojo Rabbit is another one. Right, comes in steals scenes. That you know, and that's incredible in its own right but i think it was really exciting to see him like right at the heart of this um of this comic story and as i say to be doing something i think slightly out of his usual um zone in terms of like he's playing the the more rooted character the guy who's kind of uh kept bringing gravitas as well which was a big part of like what attracted us to sam as well it's like so much of the comedy plays particularly in the in the early part of the film on like Saoirse's character making mistakes in front of the boss right in front of this guy who like is really experienced and and um and who she needs to respect and like feel like those gaffes like are gonna eat her up at night because um because she can't believe she said that in front of this you know important detective and so that's the other side of it it's like Sam brings that in spades and it was just like um once we thought of him for the character, it was kind of hard to think of anyone else. And that's even with the accent, you know, even knowing that, okay, look, he's going to, we would be talking about him doing a British accent, you know, which is, you know, as I've said, as I said, regarding Saoirse, like, look, ideally everyone would do their, their actual, their real voice, you know, mm -hmm. for me. Um, but from the first time Sam and I talked, you know, the other thing that people might, might not know about him is he's an incredibly hard worker. Like he is, he really works hard and he will only take on roles if he feels like he can, can do it, you know? So from the first chat we had about it, you know, I felt really confident that he was going to, he was going to, you know, get that right. And, and he, and I think he really did, you know, as a, as a, someone with a sort of um, middling London accent, um, he nailed the middling London accent. Yeah. I want to geek out with you about Daniel Pemberton because 
I remember uh, interviewing, or to, uh, I remember Steve Jobs came out, and I remember uh, Danny Boyle talking a lot about the process of that movie and kind of not even from the cinematography standpoint alone, where he shot 16, 35, and digital as the different years went on, but even Daniel recorded his score on different like uh, like machines that like then got better with digital digital age as we got later in the story. Um, but he's just a phenomenal composer. And now I just wanted to ask about like you working with him, like a, what what his score meant to you the first time you hear it. Um, and, you know, in terms of like a composer, a score can be a leading character. So I wonder, like, are there conversations that with Daniel almost like you have with an actor? Um, because those, because that, you know, it plays a huge part in the world of it. Yeah, and it plays a huge part in establishing place, um, at, you know, time and also tone. And again, like that was crucial for us is like, how do we how do we like support the comedy, but not overplay the comedy? How do we like um, evoke the films um, of that period in some way musically? Um, and it was a re like it, it was. I would, you know, not speaking for Daniel, but it was a it was a tricky needle to thread for us, you know, to find out where that balance lay, and not just for Daniel, it was with all the HODs. The, I'd had the same discussion really, which was that you got this period film set in 1953, and you want to create um, a world that feels like fully realized, like a fully realized version of 50s London, but at the same time, this whole film only functions from a contemporary viewpoint you yeah. need to know about the history of um cinema and theater and mysteries film noir detective novels you know all of that is sort of in there not that you need to know it in detail but you you need to know the amount that you you know subconsciously through um you know living in the world um and with daniel when it came to the score it was the same riddle that we had to kind of crack it was on the one hand, we wanted to evoke the, the music to a certain extent of, that, of the period, but then how do we unseat it enough or just put a twist on it to tell the audience, yeah, it's familiar, it feels like those things, but also there's something a little off kilter with this. It's not quite what I expected, you know? And, and so it was really, yeah, it was the same sort of approach in terms of what I talked about before with performance. It's like, okay, on the Surface, you've got a, a, a drawing room based murder mystery set in the West End of London. Well, hopefully the performances just tell you, well, but wait, is this like, what is the like real viewpoint of this film? Is it, is it made today? Is it made then, you know? And that should just um, be a little kink in it, I think. And I think Daniel's done an incredible job with the score um, by, um, you know, you at, at times like letting it really breathe into a full scale, um, you know, score that really draws on the period, but at times just bringing odd bits of instrumentation to it um, that the make you question that and just slightly sort of put a little wrinkle in it. Mm. Um, my favorite thing that he did was um, I was like, yeah, this just like this is great, but we just need something like a little more um, organic or homemade in it. That was quite often the thing was like just finding something to like um, root it a little bit somehow. And, uh, and he was like, oh, what, like, uh, like sort of this? Ding, 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 ding. And he just had a water bottle there with a thing. And that ended up in the movie, basically. He thought, like, <laughs> this water bottle filled to different heights, you know, tuning that way. And um, Wait, really? For real? Like, you filled yeah, water bottles to different heights and hit them? Yeah, you know how. It, you, you've got a half full, it'll have yeah. a different yeah. and, uh, Then if it's three quarters full. And that's one of it's in that piece when stalker is running through soho searching for stoppard yeah um, and it's got this if you listen and it's got this little ding 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 <laughs> and it's like uh, it's daniel whacking on a water bottle so that <laughs> it's like on the one hand you see him working with an orchestra and we recorded we were lucky enough to record the score at abbey road in london which was like a total oh, wow. pinch yourself moment for me um, and to watch Daniel working with that orchestra and fine tuning things on the fly was like uh, astonishing, you know, to see his, his, you know, how talented he is. But yeah. at the same time, he can bring these like really unexpected characterful flourishes to, to the music. So um, 
yeah, it was a real, yeah, real joy working. Take with Albert. that, John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Working on a glass water bowl. Uh, Tom, I'll get you out of here on this one because we're running out of time. Um, but obviously, a, a huge part about the uh, the mousetrap when it played uh, in theaters was Christy being concerned about uh, the ending and and maintaining spoilers and and swearing to the people, you know, that uh, hey, you're part of this mystery now and and don't. Don't ruin it for somebody else. What are your thoughts about spoilers uh, and especially someone who's directed a murder mystery uh, and how do you worry about containing them in the internet age? That's a great question. I generally think spoilers, my attitude overall, I mean, how long have we got here? Um, my attitude <laughs> overall is like, there should be a spoiler window, right? Um, you can't, there are no spoilers for the sixth sense at this point in time. And okay. I, I, like, if I tell you now, and I'm not going to do that because I'm respectful. <laughs> tell you now, the ending to the sixth sense. You can't go. Oh, I was going to watch that. You've yeah. had twenty. You've had twenty years. To it. <laughs> yes. Um, but so there's a there's a shelf life, I would say. But yeah, look, it's like when you know people it, treat it like you would with your friends, right? It's like you, you, if you know they're going to go and watch the movie, or they might watch the movie in the next few weeks. Look, let them enjoy it as it's supposed to be enjoyed. You know, you don't. Nobody wants those things ruined for them. What I'll say more specifically about the whodunit genre, I think, and the reveal is like, it's oddly, a, 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 although it seems it's in the name, right? The whodunit, it, it seems like the be all and end all of the genre. Everything's building to that moment. But I think that's a MacGuffin in a way. Like they're like not, um, hmm. it's not the most important part of a whodunit. Right. Like it's, I think the, the most fun part is when all the pieces are in the air, right? And you're trying to, you, you go and you meet each character and you're trying to work out what's their tick, what's their tell. Hmm. Like, what can I learn about them here? Being on that journey with the detectives as they, as they kind of try and crack the case, that's when it's at its best. So, you know, uh, I think hopefully it's a really satisfying re reveal in the, in the movie, hmm. but uh, also, they're just a great place to put characters under pressure, aren't they? Like, your detectives are on a ticking clock. They've got to crack the case, right? The boss is on to them. Every, all the other characters are usually suspects in the piece, so they're under pressure. And that's a great source of, like, drama, but also comedy, right? And so right. It, 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 um, they're just really satisfying stories, I think, to, um, to, for an audience. Well, the way I love them, yeah. I wish we had more time to talk about uh, David Ayelowo and and Adrian Brody and and some other fantastic actors that you have in, in your in your piece. So um, we really appreciate your time and coming on the show, and we can't wait to send people to go check out see how they run. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Thank you so much to Tom George for coming on the show. Uh, as for the real ones who are sticking around, as I mentioned, we're going to have a full show coming uh, to you guys on Friday. And I can confirm as well, too, because it's in the can that Baz Luhrmann is joining the show on behalf of Elvis, which is coming to home video from Warner Brothers. So another really exciting interview. You guys are going to have a ton of fun uh, with Baz in the show. He's a great fit for, for Real Blend. And uh, you guys know that we're all big fans of Elvis. So keep it right here. Uh, we will have more Real Blend content coming your way to make sure you don't miss anything that we put out here. Uh, hit subscribe and turn on your notifications. Join the Real Blend family and we'll be back with some new content very, very soon.